Welcome. We are in the presence of greatness. What an... <laughs> <laughs> It gives me great pleasure to introduce Linton and to have a, a discussion with him here today. In honour of Linton, I played his Forces of Victory album uh, full blast throughout the house. Good afternoon, everybody. I consider it a, an honour to have been invited to participate in this memorial event. I have very fond memories of Leeds, Chapel Town going back to the um, early 1970s. There used to be a group here in Chapel Town, I forget their full name, but they were called something like the Uhuru Arts Group. Back in those days, he was known as Errol Caesar. And he went on to become a, a well-known filmmaker under the name of Imru Bakari. If I remember, I, I, I attended a dance here one time after a cricket match. We had a cricket team in Brixton called Railton Cricket Club. We, from time to time, we would play the, the team from, from, from up here, from Chapel Town. And then after the match, we would come here and um, have something to eat and party. So, um, Yes, now, the so question. Leeds, no, Leeds, Leeds, it's good to hear. It's good to hear you talk about Leeds. So Leeds is a place that you feel at, at home and yes, very much yes. connected to. I've never been here um, when it's been so nice and sunny yeah. and warm. <laughs> I consider Jamaica to be home away from home. Um, it's the land of my birth. It has shaped me. I came here when I was 11 years old. I've spent most of my life in Britain, so I consider myself British. I consider London my home. I'm always glad to get away from England, but I'm always glad to come back. There have been changes, significant changes. For example, where I used to live with my grandparents um, in a little village called Sandy River in Clarendon, the houses were, were built with daub and wattle, um, with um, a thatched roof. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find any of those houses there anymore. It's all modern stuff. There was no electricity, no running water, no social amenities. Well, all that has changed. Jamaica has come a long way since independence. Um, modernity has um, put its stamp on the island. During the 1970s was a very turbulent period. The CIA was involved in destabilizing the country, and similar, similar to what they're doing in Venezuela right now. There was a rogue CIA agent called Philip Agee, who after he left the organization, the CIA exposed in a book what um, the Americans were doing um, to get rid of the, the government of Michael Manley, which was a socialist government since the end of the Cold War. There hasn't been that kind of a polarization in, in, lo in, in the local politics. Mm. In 1980, about, about 800 people died in, in, um, during the election campaign. So everybody, the two major political parties, mm. the Jamaica Labour Party, mm. which is conservative, National. and the People's National Party, mm. which is socialist, inverted commas, mm. Both of them have sort of occupied the middle ground of politics mm. now. It was a rude awakening when mm. I arrived on a cold November day, mm. and it was overcast, and I thought, my God, is this England? <laughs> um, you know, you had ideas in your head of mm -hmm. this, the mother country, yeah. you know, the mother country, this wonderful place, you know, with horse-drawn carriages and literally the streets of London being paved with coal. And then you see these ugly gray buildings, you know. Um, it was um, a rude awakening and it was a little bit traumatic in terms of schooling. Mm. That was when I, was, I first experienced racial abuse from kids, you know. But the thing about young, young people is that you adopt 
to your surroundings easier, mm. perhaps, than your parents mm. would. So it didn't take me long to settle in. Mm. The, the thing that struck me was the racial abuse mm. from kids being called a nigger and all of that kind of things. The, the racist attitude of some of the, the teachers. Yeah. Because the school I went to was one of these secondary comprehensive schools, but within the comprehensive system, there was a, a class structure. Mm. Boys from working class, lower working class background, and the unemployed immigrants were in the bottom stream. Mm. Kids from regular working class families were in the middle stream. And if you come from a family of homeowners, you'd be um, in the top stream. Mm. Mm. You had the, had the option to study Latin, Greek, um, and a foreign language, mm. European foreign language, if you're in the, the top stream. Yeah, yes. Yeah. If you weren't. Mm. So it becomes a kind of, you know, yeah. segregated um, system. Yeah. Uh, and mm. some teachers had low expectations of you yeah. because you were coming from the Caribbean. Mm. And I found it ironic because um, I won the school maths prize in my first year because the mathematics that the, I, I I saw when I arrived in my first year at Tulsa Secondary School was way behind what I was doing in Jamaica. Right. You know, because um, the, our system of education in the then mm. British colony mm. was far more rigorous than mm. anything I met when mm. I arrived here. Mm. Was it a response to that abuse that you received in school? That you because you joined the Black Panthers while you were still in school. Is that yeah. right? Yes. And was that? Do you think that was a moment during that period of your life, a quite young, as a quite young man? It wasn't just you, school. It was uh, just in, in society in yeah. general. I mean, there was not an institution in this country that was not permeated by racism, yeah. you know. Even to this day, I'm convinced that um, racial prejudice is part of the cultural DNA of, of this country. Mm. That's what imperialism and empire and all of that mm. was all about. So it wasn't just school. It was my experience of England in, in its totality. Yeah. Well, I settled with Kwesi because uh, I found out that I was born on a Sunday. Right, yeah. And Kwesi means... In tree. It's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, in tree, yeah. From, Sunday. And um, mm -hmm. I suspected that I may be, I don't know, mm -hmm. I've never done a DNA test, but I suspect that um, my, some of my ancestors were Ghanaian mm -hmm. because the part of Jamaica where I'm from, mm -hmm. they have anthropological evidence yes. of um, cultural um, um, similarities to yeah. Ghana. Yeah. I took that name on um, as a pen name mm. um, and to, as a way of identifying with my African ancestry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the whole thing happened by accident, you yeah. know. I never set out to, be, um, to become a, a reggae artist mm. and all of that. At first, I wanted to become an accountant. <laughs> because, so you're so good at maths. Because I was, well, I don't even know if it was the maths, but I liked, I liked accounts, and I did, I got a grade one in it, yeah. GCO level. Mm. And um, so I thought accountants. But I remember when I was 14 and I went to my careers um, master, the, the teacher responsible for careers advice, and told him I wanted to become an accountant. He said, accountant? Mm. A big, strong lad like you, accountant. We need lads like you in the forces. Have you ever considered a career in the armed forces? Yeah. <laughs> so that was that. And then later on, I fancied um, academia mm. when I started university. But I became a family man quite young. Um, so by the time I graduated from university, I was a father. I was a married man with three children, you know. So it was whatever job I could get yes. at the time. Yes. How I got into this reggae business um, was that I used to write copy for Virgin Records. Once Virgin had gotten involved in, in uh, marketing reggae music, mm. um, they needed people who knew how to market it. And there was a guy called John Varnum. I think he's from somewhere from Lancashire. And he was teaching in a school mm. in Brixton, um, a junior school. And he knew about my poetry. And so he recru recruited me to assist with um, writing sleeve notes um, for, uh, for albums, um, writing copy for adverts, and voicing 
the adverts. Back in the day, when I used to write my poems, I used to perform them with some Rasta drummers. Yes. Yeah. Called, um, these are guys I went to school with. Um, uh, they call themselves Rasta Love. And people always used to say, oh man, your poems sound really rhythmic, sounds really musical, you know. Um, why don't you put it to music? So I said to John Varnum, I said, people say my poems are musical, you know. Why don't you all give me a chance to make a record? Yeah. So he said, okay, um, I'm going to have a word with Richard Branson. <laughs> and um, in those days, Richard Branson was this hippie guy yeah, who wow. was just yeah. selling records um, by mail order. And then he got involved in the business. Anyway, um, they gave me 300 pounds. Uh, this is back in 1977. And I went to this little recording studio in Wimbledon and made a demo, maybe four or five tunes. And they heard it, and they liked it, and they arranged a meeting with me and Richard Branson. We went to this little restaurant in High Street, Kensington, a Thai restaurant, and, you know, said, oh, yes, I like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and they offered me a six-album deal. Yeah. And I said, no, I'll just do one yeah. and see how it goes. <laughs> and I, so um, I didn't know anything about making records yeah. or... But I knew what, I had a rough idea of what I wanted my poems to sound like with music. And I got together with some professional and some amateur musicians and uh, met with a, uh, a guy called Dennis Bavell. Yes. And we went to the studio in, in, in uh, Soho in London and recorded Dread Beat and Blood. It was released and was voted Reggae Album of the Year in Brilliant. Sounds Magazine. And um, the rest is history. Brilliant. My first break, I guess, mm. if, if you could call it a break, when I was in 1977, I was a, awarded a C. Day Lewis Fellowship and became writer in residence mm -hmm. for, the, for the London Borough of Lambeth. That lasted about nine months. And then um, I went to work in a place called the Keskedi Art Center. Mm -hmm. The Keskedi Art Center was unique insofar as it was the only center of its kind in England mm -hmm. where they combined a youth club, uh, community center, theater, mm. uh, space for artists to do sculpting and, and uh, painting and so on, um, literary mm. events. The Caribbean artist movement used to hold uh, events there. And um, a library. Yeah. And my job was to build up the library. I was mm. the librarian. And to organize um, sessions for school children, mm. teenagers. Mm. According to some guy in the, in the Spectator, mm. I have nurtured a whole generation of rioters mm. yes. <laughs> and illiterates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I was interviewing uh, Jean Binterbreeze mm -hmm. um, a while back, and she said that you were instrumental in, in sculpting and helping to shape her career and, 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 uh, and inspire her with her writing and her music. Is that something that's just come naturally to you, or have you spent? You know, have you did you decide that this was something that you wanted to do, is to to well, bring people you, up? In nothing as fancy as that. <laughs> Basically, when I began to write, I discovered that there was something similar happening in Jamaica, mm. and through the Jamaican poet Mervyn Morris, uh, through Mervyn, um, I got to know of some other poets in Jamaica who were writing a similar kind of poetry, um, incorporating rhythms from reggae mm. as well as using the, the, the Jamaican speech. Mm. They consisted of Jean Binter Breeze, mm. Michael Smith, Okua Nura, mm. Mbala, and a few others. They call themselves dub poets. Mm. This was based on a, the conceptualization of this new form of poetry by Okwanura. It was a new movement of orality mm. in Caribbean poetry, in Jamaican poetry. It gave me a sense of validation. Mm. You know, I thought, mm. oh, well, mm. I'm not a freak after mm. all. These are my guys. <laughs> you know. In 1979, I met some of these poets when I visited Jamaica. Peter Tosh had invited me 
to do a op a open for him at a concert. He was doing two concerts, one at the Ronnie Williams Center in Kingston and one at Elshire Beach. By then, I had two albums out, Dread Beat and Blood and Forces of Victory. These poets, Mikey Smith, Okwa Noura Jean, you know, mm. they thought, well, I, I'm the man, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I held the key yeah. to open the doors to success. Yes. I had founded an organization called Creation for Liberation. Through Creation for Liberation, I was able to invite, firstly, Okwa Noura mm. and Mikey Smith. They did a little poetry tour of England. Later on, Jean Binterbreeze, I invited her to the International Book Fair of Radical Black and mm. Third World Books. Mm. Creation for Liberation, I founded that organization with members of the Race Today Collective. And the whole idea was to have a platform for uh, artistic creativity that was relevant to what we saw as the black liberation mm. struggle at the time. Mm. It ended up becoming the fundraising arm, if you like, of um, the Race Today Collective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was its first chairman, but I, my chairmanship didn't last very long uh, because some people felt that I was flying too high and my wings needed to be clipped. Uh -huh. um, so I stood down as chairman, but for all intentions and purposes, mm. I was the main yeah, force, force behind, behind creation yes, for liberation, yes. even yeah. in the background. Yes. I coined the term dub poetry alongside the term double lyricism. And I was trying to write a sociology of reggae music. Mm. And I was trying to understand mm. and describe what it was that was happening mm. with the reggae DJs, mm. people like Big Youth, Hugh Roy, um, King Stitt, Prince Jasbo, and mm. others. I was very excited about this new development in reggae music. What was happening was that the instrumental version of a particular song would be mixed down to its mm. drum and bass mm. basic structure mm. and DJs would improvise spontaneous lyrics mm. in the dance hall and it became so popular it was transferred from the dance hall to the recording studio and uh, it became a genre of reggae yeah. if you like. When I was talking about dub poetry and dub lyricism I wasn't really referring to what the poets in Jamaica were doing or what I was doing, but to what the reggae DJs doing. were like, doing. Yes. Because I saw it as a kind of poetry, yes. a, a form of yeah. oral poetry. Yeah. It functioned as a kind of a voice of the people because mm -hmm. the DJs of the day would um, improvise their lyrics around whatever was topical, mm. whatever was happening mm. in the wider society or even globally. Yes, yeah. But I called myself a reggae poet. Yes, rather than a dub poet. Rather than a dub poet yeah. because I had this notion of what was happening in America, a thing called jazz poetry mm. and blues poetry, people like Langston Hughes. Yeah. And I thought, well, I want to do something similar. Mm to what the Americans are doing. Mm. By then, I'd, I'd heard um, poetry by The Last Poets. The Last Poets were a group of radical uh, revolutionary poets mm. who used the language, the everyday language that African Americans spoke mm. as a, a vehicle for, poet, for poetry. Yeah. Yes. And I thought, I'm going to do something yeah. like that with, with, um, with Jamaican verse. Yeah. Yeah, I started to write in English, yeah. but I didn't know anything about poetry. I yeah. mean, it, it wasn't something that um, I was interested mm. in at school. There was nothing in the school curriculum that kind of wowed you. Yeah. When I began to write first, the first written poetry that I was immersed in was the poetry of the Old Testament. Yeah. Yes. Because I, I used to read to my grandmother, who was illiterate, mm. and she liked the Psalms, um, Songs of Solomon, Proverbs, <laughs> and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I started writing, a lot of my early stuff was full of thou and thee and thy, and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Through my reading, I began to experiment with uh, different shapes, different forms, mm. and so on. I was a little bit, uh, felt a little bit inadequate as a, as a poet. I thought, well, you, you know, you don't know nothing about mm. this. You haven't been formally trained in, mm. in writing verse and so on. You mentioned Sam Selvan. Mm. Sam Selvan gave me the proverbial pat on the back. Oh, yeah. 
and said, keep on doing what you're doing, Excellent. Linton, and don't let nobody tell you no foolishness about proper yeah. English poetry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you, and you, and you have that poem, top notch poet. I wish I was a top notch yeah. poet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I mean, it took me a while to find my voice as a poet. Yeah. Um, maybe 30 years or more. This collection of poems, um, which was first published in the Penguin Modern Classic series, I. The, the stuff in the 70s I call the urgency of expression because, you know, you just wanted to say things. Mm. And then the 80s poems I call them learning my craft because that's basically mm. what I had to do. Mm. By the 90s now, I call that section finding my voice. Mm -hmm. These are the stages that yeah. any poet yes. um, the evolution. Go, go through. Yeah. It moved me, yeah. and I wrote a poem, which I'm not going to recite here because it's too embarrassing. Um, it, it, it's Surely not, not. It's not, not a very good poem. No. Not a very good poem at all. At that time, I was reading um, the poets of negritude, yes. who have been influenced by surrealism. Mm. I was reading people like Pablo Neruda, mm. poet from Chile. And I think those influences sort of impinged upon this, the poem I wrote, Night of you're the You're whetting our appetite for it now. But I'm not <laughs> going to read that. No, 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 I'm not going to recite that. But, um, and then later on, when, when I began to write in Jamaican, mm. um, English or Jamaican Creole or nation language or whatever you want to yeah. call it, I mentioned David Olawale in a poem called Time Come. Time Come, yes. Yeah, yeah which, you'll, which you'll read for us in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Poetry for me was a political act, mm. and poems were a cultural weapon mm. in the black liberation mm. struggle. It was about articulating how a, an entire generation felt mm. about growing up in a racially hostile environment. Mm. You know, mm. it was about um, spreading awareness of the issues mm. that were facing us mm. and the fight back. Mm. That has always been my approach yeah. to to verse, yes. you know. I couldn't um, entertain the idea of an aesthetic based on art for art's mm. sake, mm. you know. Mm. And that was a little bit precious. Mm. I, and um, I was always attracted to political verse. Mm. Well, the history of anti-colonial struggles teaches us that you have to re resort to arms, invariably resort to arm struggle mm. if you were going to have meaningful liberation. Mm. I'm all for peace, peaceful struggle, mm. but um, as the members of the African Nationalist Congress found out in South Africa, you often don't get very far mm. with the successful method of Gandhi yeah. or the civil rights movement mm. in the United States of America. Mm. Nelson Mandela founded the armed, the armed wing of the mm. ANC mm. without... Um, that dimension of mm. the struggle, uh, you, apartheid wouldn't have been ended. It mm. was, it was the, the, the defeat mm. of the South African Defense Force in Angola by the uh, MPLA with the assistance of Cuban fighters. Mm. That was the de decisive moment mm. in the end, which brought about the end of uh, apartheid yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. There will always be a cultural dimension to any struggle for justice. Mm. History has told us that. Mm. Writing poetry or making music mm. or putting on theater is not a substitute mm. for hardcore political yes, activism. getting out on the street. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Linton. Thank you very much. Is uh, that it? Is the interview is. finished? Well, it was... Uh... <laughs> I was getting warmed up. <laughs> See, I, I'd love to carry on, but I don't want to, to hog your time. <laughs>